Welcome to the First Universalist Church of Rochester, where we are called to nurture the spirit and serve the community. Whoever you are, you are welcome here. Wherever you come from, you are welcome here. Whomever you love, you are welcome here. In your joy, in your hidden sorrows, in your silence, and for your whole authentic self, you are welcome here. All of you is welcome here. It's good to be together this morning. We acknowledge with respect the Seneca Nation, keepers of the Western Door and part of the Haudenosaunee people on whose ancestral lands First Universalist now stands. And we are privileged this morning to welcome to our pulpit the Reverend Kelly Spar. Reverend Spar has been an affiliated community minister with First Universalist since 2019, but her ministry takes place mainly in the community, where she has served in a variety of roles and is currently a chaplain at Strong Memorial Hospital. It is a rare treat to have her with us for the Sunday service. It is a rare treat to be with all of you. I'm so happy to see you all. Welcome to First Universalist Church, where we are worshiping in a new way. We are a community of seekers, both online and in person, and we are choosing to worship in person, vaccinated and masked with social distance. This might be a good time to check on whether or not you have your mask on correctly, and whether or not you are maintaining good distance from others. If you are here for the first time this morning, we especially welcome you. Thank you for making it to this worshiping community. We have a visitor's form that can be found in the chat for our folks online, and that can be found in your order of service for folks in person if you printed one out. Please fill out the form so we can offer you a welcome beyond this worship service. Before we take a moment to turn to our neighbor, let us take a moment to turn towards the camera and to greet our online worshiping community. Please offer a wave. If you are online, please join us in the chat to offer a greeting and to share your joys and sorrows. If you are here at First Universalist, let us take a moment to turn to our neighbor this morning and offer a greeting. Please respect people's physical distance and obtain consent and ask for reaching out for a handshake or a hug. We encourage elbow bumps and placing a hand over one's heart while making eye contact. Let us greet one another. Our opening hymn is number 396. I know this rose will open. I had forgotten how short I was until I got up here. <laughs> and I remember there's a stool for us vertically challenged people. You guys hear me okay now that I'm taller? Mark Parent, in Believing It All, says, 
The bittersweet side of appreciating life's most precious moments is the unbearable awareness that those moments are passing. The moment before this one was precious, this moment is precious. The next moment will also be precious. Our time here in beloved community is so very precious, perhaps in ways we didn't realize before the pandemic. And we have come together virtually and in person, in small groups, as a congregation, throughout it all. It is so precious to be here together, choosing this time of communal worship to reflect, grow, and love. Let us cherish this moment and the privilege of being a part of this community and present with one another. Let us worship together, bringing our best and most wholehearted selves. Wholehearted living is about engaging with our lives from a place of worthiness. It means cultivating the courage, compassion, and connection to wake up in the morning and think, no matter what gets done and how much is left undone, I am enough. Each one of you is enough and welcome in this sacred space. Vulnerability is not winning or losing. It's having the courage to show up and be seen when we have no control over the outcome. Vulnerability is not weakness. It's our greatest measure of courage. For this hour, let us come together in recognition of our courage, our powerlessness, and our brave hearts. Would Connie Valk please come forward to light the flaming chalice? As Connie lights the chalice here in the sanctuary, and as many of you do so in your own homes, will you join me in saying our chalice words in unison? May we be a people of welcome, here to grow in heart and mind and spirit, and may we reach out to serve our community. Please rise now in body or in spirit and join me in our affirmation of faith, followed by the doxology. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve humanity in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the source and meaning of life. Thus do we covenant with each other and with all. Technical difficulties. I'll just leave it there. It's a new decoration. Thank you. Maybe. Oh, yeah, it's really in there. Yeah. Okay. I'll pull it back on later. This way I won't lose it. <laughs> I can just take it down. I clipped it into my clip. See, my mask is on. Thank you. Our story today is a folk tale from India and is supposed to be based on a true story. So several hundred years ago in India lived a young girl named Amitra. And she lived in an area of India that had uh, parts that were almost desert-like, right next to very verdant forests, living right side by side. And one day she had her tree, this is part of the story, Amitra, uh, Amritra's tree. 
And she would go there on hot days and sit in the shade, and sometimes she'd climb up to the top and wave in the breeze, and she felt like queen of the forest, and she'd tell her tree her secrets and whisper and loved it so much. And one day she was out there in the forest, relaxing in the shade, and suddenly she could tell the forest was upset. The, the peacock squawked and the birds flew off and, and the deer um, and the, the rabbits just went and scattered. And there was a bunch of, of men coming up carrying axes. And she heard them say, cut down every tree this big you can find. And so Amrita ran off to tell her mother what she had seen in the village. And her mother right away went and gathered and talked to all the other women who were there in the village. And they ran to the forest. And as respectfully as possible, Amrita's mother pressed her hands together and bowed. Namaste. We do not want any trouble, but we cannot allow you to cut down these trees. These trees, their roots hold together the soil, and without them, during the monsoon season, our village and homes would be washed away. We use their leaves to feed our cattle. We, it's our only source of shade. The leader said, we don't care about your mud huts. We are going to build a new palace for the Maharaja, and it will be the finest ever. But you don't understand these trees are our life. We will die without them. The leader said, start cutting down the trees. And the women of the village were aghast as they started seeing one tree after another go down. And they started heading for Amrita's tree. And Amrita ran in front of it, and with all of her energy and power, she knew it was the right thing to do. She embraced her tree and held her arms around it. She could feel her breath and her heartbeat in her ears. And the leader said, cut it down. And Amrita said, if you will cut it down, you will have to cut me down first. And the man with the ax, he tried. I can't do it. And when Amrita looked around, all the women and grandmothers and children of the village had all embraced the trees. Some were so large, it took generations of people to embrace that tree fully. And the woodcutters, they, they talked to each other, and they left. And Amrita's mother said, I was so scared. And Amrita said, I was too. I said, but you know, they'll be back. They're going to go and tell the Maharaja what we did, and they might come back with more axes for us. The next day, as they all worked, they, they kept their eyes darting toward the horizon, and eventually they saw the cloud of dust coming and the Maharaja. But rather than carrying an axe, he was carrying a bundle. And he asked for Amrita, said, I have brought you a royal decree to honor your courage and wisdom in protecting my lands and my people. And you have my promise that we will never cut down this grove of trees. And from then on, there were certain areas in that land that would be saved trees. They were seen as groves of life. And many trees were saved, and many more were planted. And somewhere, perhaps still today, in one of those sacred groves, hundreds of years later, Amrita's tree may still stand because of the courage of her village.
Ours is a small congregation, part of a small denomination. We have a certain amount of historical and modern day privilege, but no great political or financial power. On our own, we cannot change the world, but we can nudge it in the right direction. We can deepen our own resolve and we can work with others. The offering is our weekly reminder of this commitment to minister ever more abundant life and peace. If you're a visitor this morning, please feel free as our guest to let the collection basket pass or join us as you will in this ritual of shared devotion. If you would like to give online, please scan the QR code in your digital order of service or click on the link in the Zoom chat window. You can also, of course, send a good old physical check in the mail. The offering will now be given and gratefully received. I invite you into this reverent time of sharing the joys and sorrows of our gathered community. If you would like to, you can place your hand over your heart to be able to listen from this heart-centered place. All are invited to share your joys and sorrows in the chat, 
that we may hear from the community gathered here, whether in person or virtually. Today, we just have one stone to drop into the bowl to represent all the joys and sorrows left unspoken in the silent sanctuaries of our hearts. May all be held in the heart of love. Today, we light a white candle to acknowledge that we are a community affected by the grief, loss, and fear of living through a pandemic. May this candle's flame hold our experiences around this horrific disease. And may its light be a beacon of hope and a reminder that we are not alone. Please join me in the spirit of meditation and prayer. Spirit of life, God of our hearts, we hold in community the sorrow and fear that the war on Ukraine has brought, creating instability, uncertainty, and death to the people of Ukraine and to the global community. The daily reminders that autocracy, the abuse of power, and broken systems of government bring homelessness, famine, overwhelmed healthcare systems, and more are painful to see. But we must not turn a blind eye and shut ourselves off from these feelings of vulnerability and powerlessness that arise in us. We can and must hold on to the belief of goodness in humanity, to the belief that these stories of heartbreak and anguish will help people the world over to remember and engage in the most basic compassion and love for one another. We must open our hearts even when it feels like we are drowning in the pain because there is no avoiding it. There is no around. There is only through. And the only way to get through is to hold hands, fight against bitterness and despair, and remember that there is more. There is joy. There is the miracle of childbirth. There are miracles of recovery and courage and compassion and connection. There is the miracle of love. Open your eyes and look around this sanctuary. I see hope in the faces sitting here. I see love. I see compassion. All you have to do is look around this room to find just a glimmer of sunlight illuminating the darkness that sometimes seems ready to engulf us all. Let us continue to support goodness in ourselves in each other, and across the world, in our own small and large ways, and to remember that we are not alone in this. May it be so, and amen.
Every planetary body is surrounded by its own gravitational field, which can be conceptualized as exerting an attractive force on everything within and around. From the instant I was born until the moment I will die, to move, to sit, to stand. My body alone must fight the gravitational power of an entire planet, even if it tries to ignore it or defy it. My body knows through all its existence that it is condemned to ultimately collapse and disappear. The image of a collapse is of an abrupt failure, a material breaking down, falling downward and inward. At the crossroads of up and down, the probability for a collapse is immense. But it is in this space that new forms are possible. We can search for a breaking point where the body would rather fall upward into an extension rather than a fold, an intense breath rather than a failure. In this space, between up and down, gravity becomes a grace. I want to help my body remember that nothing can endlessly rise. In this space between up and down, my body bends to the support, but resists the universal imperative of constant movement. Thanks to the fall, my body must accept that it can only be where it is in its rise as well as in its fall. In this battle to contain itself, my body contracts or stretches time and space in search of its own truth. In this space, I am reminded that it is not the ground that I fight, but the collapse. It is not the fall that I fear, but the impact. It is not dying that I resist, but disappearing. It is not the end that I mourn, but the absence. Held by my partner, my body stands without a ground. It falls, but does not fear any impact. Elevated as a living memorial of itself, my body defies its own fading and dematerialization, and the fall becomes a hopeful ode to immortality. My yoga teacher, Lynn, who has become a dear friend in the last year, recently told me about Brene Brown's new book, Atlas of the Heart. You may have first heard of Brown as I did when I watched her TED Talk on vulnerability. Anybody? So good. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. I started reading Atlas, and at first I thought, this was just like her other books. But when I got to the second or third chapter, I realized that she has so much more to say and to teach that touched me deeply during these times of pandemic and personal struggles and war and protest. Brown quotes Dr. Harriet Lerner from her book, The Dance of Fear. It is not fear that stops you from doing the brave and true thing in your daily life. Rather, the problem is avoidance. You want to feel comfortable, so you avoid doing or saying the thing that will evoke fear and other difficult emotions. Avoidance will make you feel less vulnerable in the short run, but it will never make you feel less afraid. I wonder how many of us remember being around 10 to 12 years old and taking a drama or musical theater class or going to summer camp and doing trust falls. Anyone? Trust falls? Yes. Oops, sorry. I was never the first to volunteer for the role of falling. Although, I was often volunteered against my will as the smallest in the group. The fear of the catchers was alleviated by my safe tininess. There was no risk of dropping me. And me, I was always being picked up against my will, 
tossed up on somebody's shoulders or grabbed around the middle and swung around. I didn't grow up with language or attention to consent culture, which I'm so grateful is becoming more normalized. I was forced to hug uncomfortable relatives, to kiss dead people in caskets goodbye, to have my physical autonomy imposed upon again and again by adults and peers alike. It was too uncomfortable or risky to ask people to stop, especially because they usually didn't, or it caused actual violence if I did. And this taught me to stop prioritizing my body and physical safety as I became a teenager and young woman. I had given up the idea of bodily autonomy, and so I just gave in to advances, unwelcome hugs, being picked up and swung around. It wasn't until I got pregnant for the first time that I intentionally started caring for and protecting my own body, which ironically was being shared by my oldest child and truly no longer belonged to me ever again. Am I right, moms? <laughs> As Adam Grant writes, intelligence is traditionally viewed as the ability to think and learn. Yet in a turbulent world, there's another set of cognitive skills that might matter more. The ability to rethink and unlearn. I grew up in a turbulent family, rife with broken relationships and physical abuse. And I was lauded for being intelligent. But it wasn't until I had my own children that I really set to the work of rethinking and unlearning my avoidance of claiming my own physicality. It was motherhood that began to set me free. I know Mother's Day was a couple weeks ago. This is not a Mother's Day sermon, I promise. I realized that I wanted my children to be free, to say yes and no. And to teach that, I had to unlearn my avoidance of conflict around my body and to face the risk and wrath that came from adults in my children's lives who didn't understand why I wouldn't force them to accept unwanted hugs or sitting on laps. It's often hard to find our way back into our bodies after experiencing anguish. This is why so much effective trauma work today is not only about reclaiming our breath, our feelings and our thinking, but also getting our bones back and returning to our bodies. I haven't been around that much this year. I've missed you all. Last February, I was downsized from a career I thought I would retire from at Lifetime Hospice. And my long-term partner abruptly ended our long relationship that I thought I would end my life in. To put it plainly, I was in anguish. I no longer knew who I was. I wasn't a partner or a leader. I wasn't even sure I was a chaplain anymore. I lost my closest teammate and colleagues, and I began to lean heavily on my two best friends who sent me food, called and texted me, and loved me back to health despite months of depression and unanswerable questions. It was about six weeks later, after this multitude of identity crisis, that I remembered an old friend raving about how much she loved yoga with Adrian, which is freely available on YouTube. Totally check it out too, along with the TED Talk. I had lost touch with my yoga practice of 20 plus years, and I decided to give it a go. I think the first program I did was a 30-day program called Restore, and one of the first sessions ended with Shavasana, or that yoga nap, as my now yoga teacher calls it. As she was saying words of grounding and gratitude, she thanked viewers for choosing the practice that day, and I felt like I had been woken up from a long sleep. I lay on my mat and whispered, I choose, over and over again as tears streamed down my cheeks into my ears. A few months later, I was at a bonfire with some friends and was invited to something called acro yoga by my dear friend Matthew, who is here for you today. I had just met him that evening. His smile and easy invitation was warm and genuine, and I found myself looking forward to something for the first time in months. For the uninitiated, do you remember flying a small child in airplane on your feet at some part of your life? Anyone? 
either doing it or having done it, right? Acro yoga is a mix of yoga, core strength, facing, flying, cheerleading, gymnastics, and best of all, love. It's really the love that I found so beautiful. Everyone is included. Everyone has a chance to base, to fly, to spot, to watch, to learn, to offer enthusiastic cheerleading for one another. Brown writes, vulnerability is the first thing we look for in other people and the last thing we want to show them about ourselves. How can both of these statements be true? If we dig into the tension of that statement, it reveals truths about us. We are drawn to authentic, imperfect people, but we're scared to let people see who we really are. I want to experience your vulnerability, but I don't want to be vulnerable. Do you ever hear that joke about like new people to church? They like park right at the front of the church and they sit in the back so they can make a quick escape, right? That's true, right? <laughs> when I showed up to the acro yoga instructor's backyard a few days later, I almost just kept driving. I was near to panic going somewhere new during a pandemic, alone, without a partner or a friend. I mean, I just met Matthew. I didn't even know he was going to be there. It seemed impossible. But just like many of us whose first time at church involves that parking near the door and sitting in the back, I parked close by and picked a spot to sit as close to the gate of the yard as I could get in case I needed to make a quick escape. I was so anxious that it wasn't until the woman next to me Michelle turned and greeted me in surprise and joy that I realized I was sitting next to a friend I hadn't seen in more than a year. Suddenly, I was no longer alone and the urge to flee receded. Lynn, our facilitator, teacher, and friend, opens every new workshop by talking about the importance of consent. No means no. No is a full sentence. Down means down. You can always pass instead of speak. Wear a mask. Care for each other. Community is greater than acrobatic skill. I suddenly felt like I was among kindred spirits as I looked around and saw the nods of agreement and listened as we introduced ourselves, our pronouns, and what we hoped for that evening. Brown says, vulnerability is courage in you and inadequacy in me. I am drawn to your vulnerability, but repelled by mine. As I began to learn to fly and base bird that childhood airplane on a partner's feet, I faced my own inadequacy and fear. I felt clumsy, old, like I couldn't possibly do these things in the air with any sort of competency or grace. And... When I looked around, all I saw was that nobody was looking at my flaws. Everyone was being vulnerable, flying and falling, laughing and trying again. Lynn says, if you don't fall, you're not risking getting outside of your safety zone. And falling or failing is no time for apology. It's the time to say, surprise, and make sure everyone is OK and try again or rest, or whatever is necessary next. This has been the foundational learning in my year of recovery. I suddenly was choosing to be picked up. I was being asked for my consent, and no really meant no. Done meant done, and there was no judgment. The risk of being vulnerable paid off. Over the next 10 months, I found deep friendships. People who notice if I'm okay or not. Acro learning goes like this. Open your heart. Open your chest. Power up your legs. Stay strong. Be the foundation for your partner. Use your core. What do you want to work on? There is no left or right, up or down in acro. Communication is key. Thank you for saving my life. Acro mirrors life. It allows opportunities to choose our identity each moment. Ace, flyer, spotter. 
and to grow who we are and the depth of our expertise and joy. It allows us to try and fail and get back up again and succeed. Being upside down is terrifying and healing. Communicating our expectations is brave and vulnerable, and it builds meaningful connection and often leads to having a partner or a friend who we can reality check with. Every class and workshop with my ACRO family, new, old, or in between, ends with insights and highlights. Lynn keeps a little notebook and writes down things people say sometimes. She wrote down what I said one day. My highlight is that I am being loved into self-sufficiency. Suddenly, I knew who I was again. I am still choosing every single day. I remember who I am. I'm still a minister. I'm still a chaplain. I even got board certified last year with courage and encouragement from my friends and ACRO family. I am still lovable and worthy. I'm still a mom. I have the connection to my body back with all its aches and pains and strengths and learnings. I have learned to love it again through choosing to be vulnerable with others, making that same choice for themselves day after day, week after week. Now, I am certainly not suggesting that you all try acro yoga, but come on in, it's great, the water's fine. You are certainly radically welcome. But I am asking that in these times of uncertainty, of fear, of powerlessness, that we remember to keep the doors of our heart open, even if it's just a crack. I am so grateful for each of you, for showing up, for learning and teaching, for always showing each other care and acceptance, and for continuing to love each other into self-sufficiency on those days when vulnerability is hard and painful. I am grateful for each of us being foundation and flyer and safety net in our whole complex world of self and relationships. May it continue to be so, and amen. If you would, please remain standing as we extinguish our chalice flame this morning, and let us read together the words shown on the screen. We extinguish this flame, but we keep its light in our hearts with its message of love and justice, taking it with us to the world we live in until we are together again. Please be seated. True belonging is the spiritual practice 
of believing in and belonging to yourself so deeply that you can share your most authentic self with the world and find sacredness in both being a part of something and standing alone in the wilderness. True belonging doesn't require you to change who you are. It requires you to be who you are. May it be so.